Hello, everyone. My name is Kate Howe. As the associate for IAUG headquarters, I would like to welcome you to today's webcast, Now Generation 911 in the Enterprise Batteries Included. Get ready to flip the switch. IAUG is pleased to add to our 2012 webcast programming with this informative and ed educational event. Today's presenter is Mark J. Fletcher, ENP Public Safety Solutions, Product Strategy, Avaya. This next slide shows a couple tips for using the GoToWebinar tool. You can minimize your navigation bar by clicking the top arrow button indicated here. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the event via the question and answer box on your webinar toolbar. Fletch will take questions at the end of the webcast. Following the event, you will be allowed to evaluate today's sessions through the webinar tool. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. With nearly three decades of experience, Fletch has worked in almost every segment of the telecommunications industry. With many years in the field as a technician, as well as experience building and managing several of the world's largest private voice networks, Mark has a unique view of the telecommunications industry from various perspectives. In his current position managing product strategy for Avaya's public safety solutions, Fletch ensures the roadmap and strategy of Avaya products meet the requirements of the field with next generation feature functionality in both the enterprise and government markets globally. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Fletch. Thanks very much, Kate. I really do appreciate it. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing uh, good today. We're having, certainly having a nice uh, streak of weather here in the Northeast. So today, we're going to be talking about now generation 911. Batteries included, get ready to flip the switch. And the whole idea behind this presentation is that next generation 911 is definitely coming. It's on the roadmap. Um, it's happening at the federal level. We'll show you some instances of that. But it's really now generation 911 because there's not a, a huge drastic change necessarily within the PBX infrastructures. So what we'd like to do today on the broadcast is cover 911, how it works today. I always like to start out to level set so you have an understanding of where things are today. Then you can see better on where they're going to move to. We'll talk about a new thing called PitaFlow, and that's the real evolution revolution in next generation 911. We'll talk about the emergency location management server. That's a component in your network that's going to start feeding this data. And how devices and PBXs will deliver this data from your network into the public safety network. Since we're moving over to PitaFlow and, and new forms of data, so long, Allie. It's been nice to know you, right? Automatic number identification, automatic location identification is going to go away or can go away. From a legislative perspective, we'll look at some federal legislation. It looks like that is finally coming, and we'll give you some indications that we see out in the field. The other big topic is to cloud or not to cloud. Obviously, as we look to flatten and consolidate, there are certain benefits in the cloud. So where does 911 have a play in that model? And then we'll give you some must-have resources for the telecom manager uh, as we move forward. So as I said, we'll start off with how E911 works. It's basically routed on caller ID of any today. Each individual station has a caller ID associated with it, or assuming that it does. The PSTN sees that caller ID, makes a routing decision, and that caller ID ultimately uh, creates a screen pop at the PSAP. If the carrier screens your caller ID, they may actually convert your DID numbers back over to a main billing number, and that cr creates confusion within public safety as they'll get your main billing address and not necessarily a location specific for a particular number because they didn't see it. Rollover keys, uh, non-DID stations, they may actually send a null caller ID or a blank caller ID. And in those cases, again, the PSTN is going to try to route your 911 call by assigning a main billing number uh, to that so the 911 network can route it and that the 911 call center can get some kind of screen pop. Obviously, with today's nomadic environment, that can be problematic because your main billing address of the corporate location may not indicate where you are. I'm a work-at-home VPN user. I've been that for some eight years. I'm in a little town called Ringwood, New Jersey, some 47 miles away from Basking Ridge. But on top of that, my call server's in a, a data center out in, in uh, Colorado with my trunks in a, in a data center up in Ohio. Good golly knows where my 911 call goes out, but 
but I know that we've implemented the infrastructure in the back end. So if I dial 911, they're going to show up at my local address here, and my local PSAP is going to receive that call. But it has to be crafted. It has to be architected. So getting back on ta topic, next generation 911, how is location data going to be conveyed to the PSAP moving forward? The answer to that is very simple, PIDA flow. PIDA flow is something that you need to understand what it is. You don't have to go out and get an engineering degree, but you need to recognize what this term is. And this very simply is presence, inform, uh, information, data format, location, object, PIDA flow. Now, most people are saying, okay, Fletch, in English, what the hell is that? So what PIDAflow actually is, it's a little packet of information. And if you look up in the pink cloud here, I've got that labeled as the ESI net or ESI net. That's the emergency services IP network. That's where next generation 911 calls will flow into from the carrier environment. That's the network that the public safety answer points or the PSAPs will attach to. And that's the new next generation 911 network that will transmit or convey all this information. So you can see in the pink cloud there the little green packet of PIDA flow. And quite simply, that's a piece of data that resides in there that is either LBV or location by value. I'm at 123 Main Street, Summit, New Jersey. But it also can contain additional information that is what we call LBR or location by reference. And that simply says, hey, look, there's a, there's a phone call here that's attached to this. I've got some audio. And if you go to, you know, HTTP, A4F3, EE821C62DF1.SOS.AnyCompany.com, you're going to land on a, on a web page that's going to provide additional information about this call. And that's delivered over normal port 80 web traffic. That information, and you can, you know, I depicted that through the blue line um, down on the, on the lower right-hand side. The PSAP is actually going to dip into the enterprise to that Elm server, which is not only going to be providing location discovery, it's not only going to be providing the PIDA flow information for the PBX to send, but it's also going to have a web server component that the PSAP can reach back into your network behind the DMZ and retrieve specific information about a specific call. So how, where does the PIDA flow come from and how does it get to the PSAP? Well, in this case, if you have a SIP device, since PIDA flow is an IEEE SIP standard, it can come from the device directly. The device is going to issue an invite. The PBX just needs to honor that invite and pass all the information. The device is going to get its PIDA flow information from that Elm server. So just like it gets its DHCP IP address and whatever LLDP information, PIDA flow can be delivered to that through those same protocols. And now the phone or the device knows where it is or knows what to send on an emergency call invite. But a SIP device is not the only thing in the network moving forward. Obviously, we've got analog phones, digital sets, IP, but non-SIP phones, the old Northtel Unistim standards, H323 sets. In these devices, because PIDA flow is not part of those protocols, and you can't use those protocols on the carrier network anyway, the PBX is going to operate in an on-behalf-of model for non-SIP devices. And the PBX is going to understand where that device is, again, from the Elm server. And the PBX is going to insert the PIDA flow on behalf of the device. Although I've got an analog phone, I can still make a SIP call. I can still have a call leave the PBX on SIP. And I just have to get that PIDA flow in the SIP header. And again, the Elm server is going to be there to service the PBX and provide that information. Now, it's either going to provide it when the set registers. Hey, I've got an IP device that's registered into the network. 
can you go find it, please? Yeah, sure, no problem. It'll go out and do that based on IP address, based on switch port. We're doing that today in, in the 911 solutions that are out there for IP devices. They're already doing the location discovery. The extra added piece is, hey, I'm going to give the PBX the information, but I'm going to give the information that it can use to create a PitaFlow element to insert in the SIP header. Another model could be that the MLTS PBX, when a 911 call is initiated, it can go out and dip into the Elm server. Hey, I'm about to send a 911 call, you know, out from Fletch. What's his current PITA flow? Well, it's, it's this. Okay, great. We'll insert that in the header. Again, doesn't matter what the device is, analog, digital, TDM, IP, SIP. Both of those models can work. So what you need to look at from a PBX perspective today, and this is why I say batteries included already, what you need to do a next generation 911 call is to send a call via SIP, and if you want to be pure next gen 911, you're going to include that PitaFlow packet. So your PBX is already set to do that. Session managers, sequenced applications, that's what they're there to do, to provide this kind of environment. The thing that's new is the Elm server, and that could be your existing 911 infrastructure, just working in a little different manner. So when you look at your 911 environment, when you look at the architecture, you know, ask your vendors, hey, are you guys an Elm server as well? Now, Elm is my term. That's not a published spec, so if you ask them what an Elm server is, they might not be able to answer you, but they should have a concept of the Enterprise Location Management Server, and they should have a concept that's this drawing right here or something similar to it. But what we're looking at, really, is this information in PitaFlow being conveyed to the ESI net. Now, once it gets in the ESI net, the PSAPs are already working on taking this information in, on being a next generation 911 PSAP, or using some legacy gateway converter products, you know, that will, that will convert the SIP. But basically, what you're doing is you're providing PitaFlow out of your, you know, through your Elm server, that's going to provide information on users, devices, location, environmental data, event correlation, and this is really going to empower really, you know, your, your new environment. So when we look at event correlation, the, the example that I like to use is there's a fire in the building. My garbage can just caught on fire. I'm going to call 911. Oh my God, that fire is getting out of hand, and now the drapes are on fire. See you later. I'm not hanging out. 911 hasn't answered yet. To them, they've got a a butt dial, an empty, a blank, open 911 call. They have no idea what's going on. They, at best, have a street address of what's going on. But even if they knew what cube number it is, okay, I've got a blank 911 call. With next generation 911 and event correlation, now data can be inserted in the PITA flow. That's what we call additional data hey, here's, a, here's some data about the environmental sensors in the building. Oh, gee, all the IP-enabled temperature sensors are reading 250 degrees. We just got to hang up 911 call. Gee, I wonder what's going on. Somebody didn't leave the refrigerator open. There's probably a fire there. And then while public safety is responding, this is one of my use cases on the PSAP side, Hey, I've got all this intelligent data. I've got temperature readings from all these sensors in the building. I can hand you all of that data. Somebody out in the public safety world is going to build an app where the guy in the fire truck on his tablet is going to receive that data and say, okay, we've got a heat bloom on the north side of the building. That's where we're going to start to attack the building. This additional data is going to allow them to do their job much better. Another great use case is proxied video. A teller in a bank presses the, the hold-up alarm. With that next generation 911 call alert going to public safety, 
First National Bank, hold up alarm. Click here for video. Oh, how about that? I click on the video, and there's Victor from IAUG again with a ski mask and a shotgun. This must be a real robbery. There's all kinds of data. I don't mean to pick on Victor. Well, I do, but that's okay. But this is the kind of data that can be conveyed from the enterprise environment into public safety. We've got gobs and gobs and gobs of data about our users, our devices, the environment. We can make all of that information available to public safety where their applications can correlate that data or our applications can correlate it and we can present a converged view of the emergency right on down to physiological data from individuals. I mean we're constantly reading about smart clothing and IP enabled clothing. Yeah, this person's having a heart attack. Let me call 911 for, you know, for him and then convey all that information. I think that's fantastic. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic use case for all of this. So what's missing from the next gen 911 picture? It's Alley and PS Alley. Phone numbers don't really equal locations anymore. Right? Everybody's nomadic, everybody's mobile. We at best can bend around some solutions that band-aid the PS Alley and Alley into some dynamic locations reusing some technology based on that was developed for cell phone location discovery. The Tennessee Emergency Services Board just held a workshop down in Nashville last month. I went down there with a bunch of people from the industry to sit in on their meeting. What they told me was, hey, they've got their ESI net built. TCS has already built that. And guess what? They're in the they're in the process of taking their PS Alley data and converting it and moving that into the ESINet. Now that's significant because what they also said is that ESINet database with all of the information in there is going to be available to individuals and enterprises that want to manage their records and the management of those records is not going to be a built-for activity. You've got data in their ESINet, you're welcome to manage it at no charge. That's huge. That is absolutely huge. So down in Tennessee, we can finally say goodbye to recurring PS Alley fees. Why? Because the PS Alley database is going away. It's being moved into the ESINet in a next generation, and when it's there, it'll be, you know, it'll be PS Alley still, but it'll be ready to move into a next gen 911 environment with Pitaflow. And guess what? You, the enterprise, can manage your own data at no charge. Now, a lot of people will say, hey, listen, Annie and Alley's never going to go away. It's going to be out there for 20, 30 years. And you know what? They're absolutely right. Annie and Alley will be around until the last legacy analog telephone goes away. But keep that in perspective. Just because that exists doesn't mean that you have to use that. Why would you use it when you can use Pitaflow in a next generation environment? Can you still buy a rotary telephone today? Absolutely. Why would you? I have no clue. But you could, and the network will handle it. But be careful when you buy a next generation 911 solution that starts talking about any and alley management and doesn't start talking about Pitaflow in an Elm server or something that they name that does the job of an Elm server. Provides location discovery, provides Pitaflow information to the devices and the PBX that needs it, provides on-site notification, and is sitting there as a web server for public safety to query based on a URL or URI that's conveyed to the PSAP in that SIP header. That's what you need to be looking for. The other big question everybody asks, what about the legislation, Fletch? 18 states now have a reference to MLTS PBX. Michigan was 17 at the first of this year. They're not going into effect for five years, but they have got penalties for noncompliance. And then out of the blue, 
New Hampshire came on board. Not because they passed an MLTS specific law, but the state 911 coordinator said, hey, this law over here said that if you provide PBX telephone service, you're considered a carrier. And this law over here says if you're a carrier, you have to provide 911 service. I'm going to put those two laws together and say if you operate a PBX, you have to be compliant with 911. And he sent universities and a couple of large corporations letters stating, hey, you guys are not compliant. So all of a sudden we had a new law with, without any comment period, but just by fact that a few other laws that were out there. OSHA maintains you have to maintain a safe workplace. If you can't dial 911, is your workplace safe? I don't think that would be a hard argument. As, as Martha Beyer, who I go to for legal all the time, says, you know, even a marginal attorney could argue that fact. The FCC issued a notice of inquiry this year as part of the new Next Generation 911 Advancement Act that was part of the middle class tax relief package that was signed in January. Part of that package, part of the Next Gen Advancement Act, was the government putting out a notice of inquiry on MLTS PBX location discovery capabilities. So the FCC filed a formal notice of inquiry last month. Now, mostly carriers responded to that. Avaya responded to it. Um, 911 ETC responded to it. Nina, APCO, a bunch of the other organizations. Nina responded and had reply comments that said MLTS location capabilities are feasible and the FCC should begin a proceeding to establish a time frame for mandatory implementation. What they called off in their papers, what I called off in mine, is that, hey, we have enterprise users that live in many more states than the 18 on this map. It's very difficult when a corporation has offices in Vermont and Texas and Washington and Colorado and Florida and Minnesota and Illinois, and none of that legislative requirement is the same. And what they do is they, they force to, themselves to comply to the most strictest one. Why create this problem for enterprise PBXs? There should be a national minimum standard that everybody complies to. And if a state wants to regulate beyond that, that's their business. But there should be a basic core set of functionality. As we move the technology forward and we flatten and consolidate our networks, this becomes even a bigger problem. The Department of Homeland Security in the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications has been involved in implementing what they call the National Public Safety Broadband Network, or NIPSBIN. And Secretary Napolitano is going to work with the, her federal counterparts and appointed members of what they call the FirstNet Board, that's a new federal corporation that was formed that is going to actually deploy and govern NIPSPIN. Now FirstNet is a U.S. government entity that's a private corporation like Amtrak, Fannie Mae. They're a company. They have to operate at a profit. They own the licensing for something that's called the 700 megahertz D-block. Remember when UHF TV had to clear all the upper channels? The reason they did that was to free up some spectrum that was called, that's called the D-block, nationwide end-to-end -end radio frequencies, basically, that said public safety can operate here. Because they were TV, they were common frequencies from coast to coast. They're now clear. That takes care of the interoperability problem. Everybody's on the same channel. Chain channels and compatible frequencies. FirstNet also gets the data connection out to the public safety first responder. Hey, we've got all this great data. I've got floor plans. I've got temperature sensors. Hey, that's wonderful. How do I get it to the guy in the ambulance? How do I get it to the guy in the fire truck? I need broadband wireless data to do so. I'm going to need some assistance from the carriers. I'm going to need some assistance from private industry to ensure that that data gets there. And that's where DHS comes in, in implementing that NIPSPIN, National Public Safety Broadband Network. And again, the FCC, part of those requirements, 
and the location capabilities of PBXs are again part of that big infrastructure. I want to feed this data to the first responder. I need the PBXs to be able to generate it. I need the network to be able to transport it. Those two pieces are here and very close to being here, or can be here if you want to put them in. Now, once I get the data in the network, how do I get it out to Joe Fireman? Well, DHS is building that network and designing that network right now. FirstNet was just formed, literally, um, the, the board was just announced a couple weeks ago at the public safety show in Minnesota. So that's moving forward. But what about hosted 911 environments? This is, everybody's looking to flatten and consolidate. This is where I really need next generation 911. Flattening is putting your call servers into a centralized data center, putting your trunks there. You could put all your equipment there. I'm sitting here in New Jersey with just an IP phone. The hardware is in Basking Ridge, Colorado, and Ohio depending on what I'm doing. My trunks are actually in Ohio. What I need when I make a 911 call is I need to, the PBX environment to understand where I am, first of all. That's the most important thing. Where is this user? Because if I don't know the location, I don't know what to do with the user. So there's location discovery as part of it. And that's provided by select product partners such as Conveyant and the Century E911 location management server that they produce. Now if I flattened and I'm centralized, how do I get my trunks in Ohio out to the PSAP in Washington or Texas or Florida? Well that's done with what we call a VPC carrier, voice positioning carrier. Basically, you send your 911 call via SIP to a VPC provider. And there's only a couple of these. There's bandwidth.com, there's Entrato, um, there's Connexon up in, uh, up in Canada, and there's TCS. There's basically four suppliers. It's like, it's like buying long distance 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? You went to AT&T, Sprint, MCI, the long distance companies. Everybody sold it or resold it. There are really only a couple of carriers in the back end. Next Gen 911 or VPC services are the same thing. So regardless of who you buy your VPC services from, find out who their network provider is on the back end and do some research on that vendor so you understand what you're actually getting. But back to the FCC environment or FCE environment, too many acronyms, alphabet soup here. The PBX will send that call setup via SIP to your next gen 911 VPC provider, which is your entry point into this national VPC network. And the VPC provider delivers your call to the selective routers in Florida or the next generation 911 environment that's up in Texas or up in Washington, or Illinois, or wherever. There are next-gen 911 environments popping up all over the place. Vermont, Massachusetts, Maine, Florida, North Carolina, uh, Chicago, California, Hawaii, Texas. There are networks being turned up right now, and there are a ton of networks that have RFPs out right now. There's a company out there that uh, the name is kind of irrelevant to the enterprise space, but it's a company called Solacom. And they're a New England-based voice over IP next generation PSAP company. I just met their uh, their VP out at the, the APCO 911 show out in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota the other week. And Solacom is building next generation 911 PSAP networks in quite a few places around the country. And he came up to me and he said, Fletch, when am I going to get Pitaflow from an enterprise PBX? And I said, are you ready for that right now? He goes, absolutely. I'm going to turn up here, 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 and here. And if 
at, in those areas, I want you to send the next gen 911 call directly into my ESI net. I don't even need the carrier to handle that for me. You can connect directly to my session border controllers. I'll look at the PIDA flow, I'll route it to the right piece app, and the right call taker will get the call and have all the PIDA flow information presented right to them on their desktop. Imagine that. I dial 911 and a floor plan of where I am pops up right in the dispatcher. No PS Alley, no information being translated and updated 24 hours after I move and I hope that it all goes right and I hope the carrier didn't screen my number to the main billing number. No. 911, next gen 911, here's where I am, I need help, please come and get me, here is a map. And they're ready to turn that up literally in the next couple of months. That's exciting to me. So when we have hosted 911 environments, yeah, absolutely. I think that's great. But then you need to think about your 911 side because although full compliance in all states is important and that in a hosted environment gives you that, web-based dashboards for users to enter their location, I can still put devices out on premises to do location discovery because I don't want to do layer two location discovery from the cloud. The device is in my network, on my network, in my LAN. I'm not sure I want something from the wide area network coming through to start scraping data off my switches. I'd rather have a local piece of software there doing that and then just putting the information out there that needs to be put out there. So it leads to the question of can or should my E911 be in the cloud? And the answer is any technology can be located absolutely anywhere. The question is really should you put it there? But the answer to that is that where that technology is located is entirely up to you. You have to develop cases for rainy day and sunny day operations. I'll give you a big example. You know, back in the Nortel days, we won the UPS account. Now, UPS has got little mom and pop UPS stores all over the U.S., hundreds of them. The big question was, do we do a hosted solution? In that case, the hosted solution may have made sense for their network connectivity. But their local survivability, their rainy day mode, they needed POTS lines. Why? Because my little local UPS store in Ringwood, New Jersey, I know the owners, I see them on a regular basis. Hey, Fletch, how's it going? I walk in there to do business. I need to call them and say, hey, Barbara, can, you know, I got a package. Did, did the UPS guy come or can I run down there real quick? I need to be there. I need to talk to them there. So rainy day is I need a POTS line here. And I'll go back to Nortel again in the Parsippany office. We had, I don't know, 20, 25 people in that office. I can remember two times where we were dark. First time, somebody took out the power transformer in front of the building, right off the ground. That's it. We were out. We were not going to have power for three days. What did everybody do? They grabbed their laptop, grabbed their cell phone, and we went home and got on the VPN. Another time, somebody took out a telephone pole. It took them two days to reroute the phone lines. We had power but no phone. What do we do? Everybody grabbed their laptop, grabbed their cell phone, packed up, and went home. Our rainy day operation was make sure the door's locked. We didn't even want or need local survivability. Why would I want to maintain a PBX to run in a building that no one's going to be at? Rainy day, sunny day use cases. That will tell you where your technology needs to be located. If you become isolated, and you lose your external network, what is your survivability requirements? Where does 911 need to go, and how is it going to get there? If I'm relying on a completely hosted environment, and I'm going to stay open, I've got no 911 if the network's down. And if I'm going to 
operate in an isolated mode, will I still be notified of on-site events? Maybe I will have local trunking. Well, do I have a resilient 911 solution that's still going to let me know? Hey, somebody up on the third floor, just dial 911. Or because my network connectivity is down, I've lost my link to the cloud where my 911 stuff is. I'm not saying any, either one is more right than the other. What I'm saying is you need to draw up your rainy day and sunny day operations use case and what your telephony environment is going to look like and what your 911 environment is going to look like. It might be as simple as, yeah, two people are going to hang around. Um, we're not going to provide them dial tone because they've got cell phones and we've got good cell phone coverage. Great. Okay, that's what it is. For that business, that's what makes sense. I can't tell you that on a webinar. I can't give you a model that fits 100% of my clients out there. What, are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. And for somebody to sell a specific model is not being realistic with you. You have to look at what your requirement is, not what a solution provides. Define what you need and then buy the solution that fixes that problem. This is why E911 is not a configuration task. It's an engineering exercise. It needs to be thought through. The hardware can be minimized. The software can be virtualized. Whatever you decide, be sure you understand both the risks and the rewards, and then just do a sanity check. Hey, what makes sense for me with how I have to operate? Avaya maintains a lot of presence out on, on the web, avaya.com forward slash public safety, and then my weekly podcasts and blogs at avaya.com forward slash Fletcher or on Fletch.tv. There's information about the environment uh, you know, that we operate in in public safety. Our presence in public safety is with NINA, the, Net, the 911 Association. Our subject matter experts maintain the NINA ENP certification. And you'll even start to see vendors maintaining that certification now as well. Key standards and work groups within APCO and NINA. The President's NSTAC, the National Public Safety Broadband Network. The scoping and the um, definition committees. The Federal Communications Commission, Emergency Access Advisory Committee. That's what I'm really proud of. That's taking next generation 911 and making it available for people with disabilities. TDD, TTY machines, making people type on those 20 pound luggables. What are you kidding me? Every person who's deaf and can't speak uses SMS, text, email. They can't use 911 right now on those devices. That's a crime. The National Emergency Number Association, where I'm probably most uh, active, the MLTS PBX model legislation, the ESI network design, next gen 911 additional data work group, additional data, that's the data that's going to come from the enterprise. And the next gen 911 transition plan, helping PSAPs get over the hump so they can convert their side of the network to be able to receive next generation 911 data. And that's where the transition is going to occur, not on your side. There's no transition on the PBX side. We have SIP trunking. We have devices that can put PIDA flow in the header. There is no transition to next-gen 911. It's here today. You have it, and you can do it. You just got to turn it on. And then over in Europe, the uh, sister organization of NINA, ENA, the European Emergency Number Association, with their eCall operations document, that's their version of OnStar, and multi-language, uh, multilingual calls. You think you have problems over here. My God, I got PSAPs over there that have to answer in 15 different languages because of the locality that they're in. So I hope this has been some good information, and I hope I've raised some questions. I really appreciate you joining me today. And at this point, I want to turn it back over to uh, Kristen and Kate and open up the bridge for any comments, questions, spare change, whatever you got. I'm, I'm willing to dish it out. So thanks very much for attending today. Back to you guys. Thanks, Mark. We don't have any spare change that came in, but we do have some <laughs> questions. Good. I know I wasn't expecting any. Maybe next time, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, first question is: Pitiflow supported by LEC in Canada? By the LEC in Canada. So Pitiflow, uh, I don't have an exact answer to that question, um, but I will say if it isn't today, it will be in the future. Great. Thank you. 
Can you please provide documentation on the New Hampshire 911 State Coordinator's opinion? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I've got uh, I've got a couple of uh, I think Martha Byer did. Um, she just released a, a, a white paper that's available at um, thevoicereport.com, uh, which you know, and CCMI owns them, so it's available on CCMI's website. And that was sponsored by 911 ETC, so 911etc.com is downloadable for that. In that white paper, Martha spent probably three weeks in documenting the sources for her information. So not only is it a great white paper on, on 911 in general, it is a great um, piece of, of documentation for sources. And I know she covers the New Hampshire stuff in there and covers the actual links to the legislation that he took and said, these two pieces that go together make up what I think is MLTS 911. Great, thank you. Um, are the VPC providers coming down in cost? Yeah, I think so. Um, and it's mainly because what's happening is, you know, VPC providers used to go in and manage at the station level. So if you had 10,000 users, you paid, you know, X dollars for, you know, 10,000 users apiece. Um, looking at the zone level way of doing 911 works for VPC providers as well, and they call them Elin Earl pairs. So where you may have 5,000 people in your building, you might only have 10 Earls or zones in your building. You only need one VPC record for each one of those zones. So instead of 5,000, you're only buying 10. So maybe the cost per record has not come down but the ability to use much less records uh, is there, so the total cost of that solution is going to come down. And the big part of that is now you've got money to put on site to do an on-site notification solution because the discovery is still going to happen on site. The notification still should happen on site because if you do go dark, you want those services running internally. Great, thank you. Next question. Silicon is based in Gatineau, Quebec. Are there other companies that are next generation 911 ready? Yeah, they are. They are based in uh, in Quebec. There are the other main providers uh, that are out there. There's a company called Synergym that's down in North Carolina. They actually have a next gen 911 network up right now in the, uh, I believe it's uh, Surrey County in Wake, uh, North Carolina. The network's up. It can process calls today. They're not taking live traffic right now. Um, you have companies like uh, Intrato that is putting up some migration networks in Texas. You've got Cassidian, which is a partner on the PSAP side. Again, they're also doing some stuff with Next Generation. Microdata is another company. You see a lot of these little niche boutique players in Next Generation 911 because I don't need the big heavy iron anymore. It's kind of like when mainframes moved to the PCs. Before, when mainframe days, you wanted to buy a computer, you went to IBM. Once desktop came, desktops came out, you had Epson, Compact, and every, you know, HP, and everybody and their brother making desktops, right? So next generation 911 is also forcing the public safety side of that industry to really go through some migrational challenges. Solacom is one of the more active players that's out there. They're one of the more prevalent uh, selection choices that I see happening in the RFPs. And, you know, again, they operate in the States and they're, you know, he's the first one to come up to me and say, Fletch, when are you sending me Pitaflow? I want it now. So that's one to watch where they're working because that's going to be the first area with NextGen, in my opinion. Thank you. Next question. What's your best guess? How many decades or centuries will pass before any of this becomes commonplace? <laughs> so I had, I had one of the VPs of, of TCS on a podcast last year, and he said the summer of 2012 is when you'll have the first NG911 networks up and operational. And he was pretty much right in the money with that. There were networks up and operational, not in service, but operational. Um, my best guess based on um, what I know, who I know, and, and what they're telling me, their state of readiness, I'm going to go on the line 
and say, I am, I'm going to do an Adam Savage on Myth, Mythbusters. I'm 80% sure that we're going to have a next generation 911 network before the end of the year. I'm 90% sure that we'll have one bef uh, in the first quarter of 2013. And I'm 100% sure that before next summer, before June 1st, you will have several next gen 911 networks up taking calls. And I'll add to that, you will have one of those networks at least having the capability of taking PETAflow directly from the enterprise into that network. So there, I've, I've gone out about as far on the limb as I care to go because I really hear it creaking behind me. Thanks, Mark. Next question, is there a list of PSAPs that are going to NG911? How would I find out my PSAP plan? Yeah, so that's a good question, which because you want to know when your PSAP goes to NG911. There is not a list that I know of. There's not actually I tried to find a list last night of just current deployments and couldn't even find that that was accurate because there was stuff I knew about that wasn't there. I'll tell you to watch Nina.org, N-E-N-A dot O R G. Um, on there they've got a section on next generation 911, the next gen 911 project. Um, I will stay on top of them to make sure that they are providing enterprise users with information that they need to know about NG 911 and see if they can't put up a map of where NG 911 is being deployed with active projects. I uh, have another color that shows RFPs that are out because that's at the state level and then, you know, have a color for where NG911 networks are actually operational. Um, because again, it'll be, it won't be, you know, this town, that town. It'll be these group of counties, this state, you know, these couple of states in an area. So there'll be large areas when they get turned on, there'll be large areas. So it'll be very easy to coordinate on, that on a map. And when I talk to the Nina guys, um, I'm going to really push them hard to produce that map for our enterprise users who want to track what's going on. I think it's an important data point. And whoever raised that question, thank you. That was, that's an excellent question. Great, thank you. Next question, what are examples of additional data that can be part of an enterprise hosted database? Oh, good question, yeah. So there's a lot of information that an enterprise could have here. And I'll back up a couple of slides um, to show you some of that. There it is. So you have information on users, devices, location information, environmental data, event correlation, maps, temperature sensors, video feeds, could be other data from other services. You know, there was a large, um, there was a large university um, that had a horrible shooting years ago. You all know who I'm talking about. They were talking about 911. And they were talking about next generation 911. Turns out that that university has written an internal application that does cable plant management, wire map management. Well, I don't care whose 911 solution that, that they buy, and I believe they chose to build their own, but that database of cable management is extremely valuable on a 911 call. So they're going to, you know, that's data that can be made available. Now, you might need applications on the other side that correlate that data. But that's the kind of data, you know, physical plant data that's going to be available. I mean, even a proxy of a video feed. You're going to come to this publicly accessible web page that's in my DMZ that I have control over, but I'm going to proxy to you specific video feeds like the bank robbery. You know, that's incredible data. Those are the use cases that we did for public safety. Something that's not MLTS enterprise related, but Motor vehicle accidents with OnStar, they can predict with 80% reliability based on the sensors what the injuries are in the vehicle. If I've overturned five times in the middle of the, of the, uh, of the median of the highway and I've got severe lower extremity injury and I need a helicopter, yeah, I'd like the PSAP to know that when they get the first indication of the accident. Why? Because the hospital's on that same ESI network. They can put a helicopter in the air the same time the fire department, the police department, the medics are being dispatched. Heck, the fire, the helicopter could be the first on the scene. 
So that's the data that can be used and, and how it could be used, which I believe are important to use cases. But that's the kind of data that's going to come from the network. Thank you. Next question. Is Avaya E911 system JITC certified in the Department of Defense? We have JITIC certified solutions. I don't know what the current list is, but I can, I can get that for you. Okay, how does PSAP callback work if you aggregate DIDs to a single line? That's a great question. So that goes back into some of the PBX functionality and uh, deals with legacy telephone number resolution. So in, if you have a blue system, the, the CS1000, there is a dynamic ELIN, emergency location identification number, that is borrowed for your caller ID on the way out of the call of the system. In that case, the ELIN, when properly configured, is mapped to my internal non-DID extension number for a period of time. The default's 15 minutes. PSAP receives that ELIN number, and if they dial it back, that ELIN will ring back to my station. Best practice programming is to have the ELINs go to security when they're not being called forwarded to a user. That way, if somebody calls back after the timeout mapping period, they'll at least go to somebody who will have some indication, again, on-site notification is important here, of, oh yeah, that was a 911 call, yeah, the phone's not mapped there anymore, but I've got all the information about what happened. In the Avaya Red, um, there's also an ELIN element in there as well. And again, the mapping takes place where that borrowed reporting number gets mapped back to a user device. Great, thank you. Next question. What is Avaya's solution of the ELM server specific to CS1K, or are they utilizing third party? We utilize third party. So the ELM server is not something that I really want to build. And the reason for that is because next generation 911 standards are evolving. There's a framework document that's been put out and was promulgated um, this past summer, and that's the NINA 08003 document. That's what we call the operational end state. This is how next gen is going to work. There are still protocols. There are still um, sub pieces of that document that are being developed as we speak. Avaya is a huge company. Avaya, you know, to to be responsive. Once I get a team working on something, if I need to get that team to change course quickly. You know, it's like SS Avaya making the turn. It takes me a little bit to make that turn. With the speed that Nina is moving and the standards are being um, promulgated, I would rather have an external vendor that actually participates in those committees and knows what's going on and knows the roadmap, even before its official roadmap, has an idea of where the roadmap is going. I'd much rather have third-party DevConnect partners working on that because those companies, whether they're 20 employees, 50 or 100, can turn on a dime and they have already. The standard was going one way, you know, a meeting happened, some relevation came out, oh my god, we've got to change, great. You know, those guys were in the meeting going, okay, we're changing directions here because, you know, there's a, there's a new, you know, we're taking a new tact. In two days, They've got that worked out and a prototype delivered. I could never, I could never be that responsive. I can guide, I can, you know, well, once that's built, may we look at buying something or bringing it in-house? Yeah, sure. But when you have a dynamic, rapidly evolving, and I mean, I mean evolve, not rapidly evolving, like voice over IP is rapidly evolving, you have got next gen revolving at light speed. I mean, literally, I'll have two meetings in one week with different opinions on something. When something is moving that fast, it is almost impossible for a large company to stay on top of that. And I can't wait around until everything's standardized because I'll be behind the curve. So that's why we look to our third-party DevConnect partners. Thank you. Next question. How is a given extension associated with an area? Is it based on IP address, which requires distinct IP ranges per area, or is it a manually configured database? Yes. 
<laughs> it's whatever makes sense for that extension. It can be IP address subnetting if that works for you. If it doesn't, then layer two switch port discovery will work for you. If neither one of those work for you, and I've got environments where, hey, I've got a little office out here and they're sharing IP subnet space with somebody else and, you know, I can't put a list in that network out there to track IP phones. Okay, well then your 911 solution is locked down IP phones on specific switch ports in hard-coded ELE and EARL information. Is it the best? No, it's the cards that you have to play with. So all of the above is correct. You want to be as flexible as you can. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, what is the vendor of the current E911 now? Are you affiliated with Red Sky Technology E911 system? So in the DevConnect program, we have several 911 vendors. We have Amcom, we have Red Sky, we have Conveyance Systems, we have 911 ETC, we have 911 Enable. I apologize if I forget, if I've forgotten any of the others that are in DevConnect. Right now in our DevConnect Select Product Program, we have 911 ETC for our VPC services, and we have Conveyance Systems as our Enterprise Location Management Server, Location Discovery, On-Site Notification uh, Supplier. Those are the Select Product Partners right now in the program. Great, thank you. Are there other companies other than 911 ETC that supply the hosted solutions you referenced for FCE? Who are they? Oh yeah, any, any anybody that's touting hosted 911 provides that solution. Um, 911 ETC provides hosted solutions. They use broadband primarily as their backbone. Um, 911 ETC does hosted. That's actually their parent company. I believe it's Connexon uh, up in Canada that provides the hosted solution. Uh, Red Sky uh, uses Intrado primarily out in uh, Colorado for their VPC solution. Um, TCS, not typically an enterprise player, but I think if you're big enough, they will do business. They use, they're their own network uh, in addition to providing backup networks to everybody I just mentioned. Uh, they will provide or they can provide a hosted 911. I think you've got to be a really, really, really large, I mean like humongous multinational before they'll deal with you directly, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Great. Thanks, Mark. We do have more questions, um, although I know we're just about out of time for today. So we can send those your way and have you answer them, and we will then post them along with the presentation and the audio on the website in our archives for our members. Yeah, sure, absolutely. You just send me a list. We'll be happy to answer them. Perfect. Sure Great. We will do that. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for participating in our webinar today. We appreciate Fletch and everyone online attending our event. Please do be sure to complete the evaluation for today's event. Your feedback and input are important and appreciated as we further develop the webcast program. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending, and we'll see you later.